Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Kimmy Hardy? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Kimmy Lynn Hardy was born on September 7, 1960, and was raised in the town of Keokuk, Iowa. This is a small town of about 10,000 people, located in the southeast corner of Iowa, where the Des Moines River meets the Mississippi. Kimmy married when she was young and had two children. That marriage didn't work out, and the couple divorced. Kimmy married for a second time, had a son, and divorced. She married for a third time in 1993, that marriage only lasted two years. In 1996, Kimmy married for the fourth and final time to a man named Robert Hardy. At some point, Kimmy became casually acquainted with a woman named Teresa Lynn Lund. Teresa was born in 1962, so she was pretty close in age to Kimmy, but that's not all the pair had in common. They shared the middle name Lynn, although it was spelled differently, and just like Kimmy, Teresa had a string of failed relationships. She married at the age of 18, had a daughter in 1981, then divorced. Teresa had a serious romantic relationship with another man. They had a daughter together in 1986, but this relationship failed too. In 1990, Teresa met a crane operator named Terry Bell. They had a daughter together in 1991. On July 16, 1996, the couple had a son named Paul Bell. By this time, Terry was working in Gary, Indiana. The couple planned on moving to Gary before the summer was over. The city of Gary was a dangerous place in the mid-1990s, and it is still dangerous as of the time of making this video. Gary once had the distinction of being the murder capital of the United States. Teresa never had a chance to move to Gary because, in a manner of speaking, someone in Iowa brought Gary to her. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On Thursday, August 29, 1996, at about 10 a.m., one of Teresa's friends called the police and told them that Teresa and her son Paul were missing. Teresa had failed to pick up her two daughters from school the previous day. Here's what the police found during their investigation. Teresa was last seen dropping her daughters off at school on Wednesday, August 28, at about 8.15 a.m. Another witness saw her in town at around 10 a.m. This was the last known sighting. Teresa's mother found her car parked at a county market. Paul's car seat was missing from the vehicle, but Teresa's purse and checkbook were in there. The police went to Teresa's residence, but did not find anything suspicious. Teresa's husband, Terry, was the first obvious potential suspect, but he was in Gary, Indiana on the day Teresa went missing. Investigators were able to confirm his alibi. Terry told the police that he last saw Teresa on Sunday, but spoke to her by telephone on Tuesday. That was the last contact he had with her. Investigators would receive an important lead on September 14, 1996, when an anonymous caller contacted the FBI in Kansas City. She told them that a married couple in Keokuk named Kimmy and Robert Hardy had a new son. The son was supposedly born on August 28, the same day Teresa went missing. The caller believed that the boy looked a lot bigger than a newborn. The police stopped by the Hardy residence on September 17 to investigate. They spoke to Kimmy and looked at her son. They pretended that they were satisfied that he was a newborn, but they immediately knew he was not. Investigators started working on collecting evidence to justify a search warrant. During this process, they spoke to Kimmy's sister-in-law. She told them that Kimmy asked her to sign as a witness on the birth certificate, even though she had not witnessed the birth. The sister-in-law refused to sign and thought the situation was highly suspicious. After obtaining a warrant, the police visited the Hardy residence once again. They found that Kimmy, Robert, and their new son were gone. Neighbors were at the residence babysitting the other children. The police were able to find out that the missing members of the Hardy family were just outside of town by tracing a phone call that Kimmy and Robert placed to the babysitters. When the police drove to the location revealed by the trace, 
Robert threatened them with a steel pipe. Robert was taken into custody, and his new son was taken to the hospital. Kimmy Hardy chose to speak to the police. Here's what she told them. Kimmy admitted that Paul was not hers. She said that her husband wanted a son and implied that she wanted to satisfy his desire. In the middle of this dilemma, Kimmy just happened to meet up with an old drug dealer named Anthony. Kimmy told the police that she used to be a drug dealer herself and that Anthony was her supervisor. After Kimmy told Anthony the story about Robert wanting a son, Anthony told her that he knew someone who had a baby. He could arrange for an illicit adoption for $3,000. As Anthony was working on arranging the adoption, Kimmy told family members and friends that she was pregnant. She talked about baby names. For five months, she wore maternity clothes, and she even threw a baby shower. Kimmy said that on August 28, Anthony sent two Mexican men to her home. These men dropped Paul off to her. That was the end of Kimmy's story to the police. A footprint analysis at the hospital confirmed the baby that Kimmy had was Teresa's son, Paul. He was returned to his father, Terry. Investigators confronted Kimmy, wanting to know where Teresa was. Kimmy denied knowing Teresa. In addition, she claimed that she did not know how to get in contact with Anthony or the two mysterious Mexican men. Kimmy was arrested and charged with kidnapping, purchase of an individual, and child stealing. Investigators managed to track down the person who had contacted the FBI and supplied the tip. As it turns out, she was a friend of Kimmy's who attended the baby shower. The friend had another story to tell the police. In late July, she was with Kimmy when Kimmy was shopping for a pistol at a pawn shop. Kimmy asked the salesperson some unusual questions about the performance and function of a particular pistol she wanted to buy. For example, how close she needed to be to kill somebody with it, how messy the cleanup would be after killing a person, and if it would blow someone's head off. The salesperson refused to sell Kimmy the pistol, probably because of the blowing someone's head off part. On July 31, 1996, Kimmy went to another pawn shop and purchased a Lorsen 380 semi-automatic pistol, as well as ammunition. The police were handed another big break in the case in the form of Kimmy's husband, Robert. He entered into a plea agreement with the state. Here's what Robert told the police. Kimmy told him that she was pregnant and he believed her. On Wednesday, August 28, he went to work as usual. While he was there, he was notified that Kimmy had given birth at home. Kimmy had a newborn son, or at least that's what Robert thought. Everything was fine until Robert noticed a terrible odor in the house. He thought that the sewer backed up. When the smell did not improve over time, Kimmy told him that there was a body in the crawl space. Robert went down into the crawl space and confirmed that Kimmy was telling the truth. Concerned about going to prison, Robert helped Kimmy dispose of the body about six miles away near railroad tracks in Alexandria, Missouri. They also disposed of the pistol by throwing it in a pond. After the police found Teresa's body, bullets were recovered from her head. One of them was matched to Kimmy's Lorsen 380 semi-automatic pistol, which the police found in the pond where Robert said it was. Kimmy received an upgrade in her charges. She was now facing first-degree murder. In February 1998, Kimmy went to trial. The state argued that Kimmy invited Teresa to her home and shot her twice in the head with the Lorsen 380. She drove Teresa's vehicle to the county market and left it there. Kimmy was convicted of first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, and child stealing. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ultimately, Robert pleaded guilty to interference with official acts and possession of a firearm by a felon. He served three years in prison and was released in 2002. In April 2009, Teresa's husband and Paul's father, Terry Bell, drove his 1992 Chevrolet Camaro head-on into a tractor-trailer on U.S. Highway 61. The truck driver tried to avoid Terry, but did not have success. Terry did not survive the collision. He was 48 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Kimmy Hardy maintains her innocence, but
but there is no doubt about her guilt. It's clear that Kimmy murdered Teresa in order to take Paul. Her story about a mysterious man named Anthony was fabricated. The police were able to locate Anthony. He worked as a baker in another city and had nothing to do with the crime. Kimmy expanded on her story about Anthony and the Mexican men when she testified in her own defense at trial. She claimed that she really had been pregnant, but she miscarried five days before Teresa disappeared. Kimmy said that she paid Anthony $1,500 and gave him the Lorson 380. This was a change from her original story where she paid him $3,000. After the two mysterious Mexican men showed up at Kimmy's house, they told her to take a ride for a while. When she returned an hour and a half later, they gave her Paul. They also told her that they ran into a little trouble and she needed to check the crawl space under her home. The next day, Kimmy discovered Teresa Lund's body. Kimmy didn't do herself any favors with the revision to her story. She admitted that she knew Teresa's body was in the crawl space. Kimmy also admitted that she failed to contact the authorities. Item number two, Kimmy Hardy had a tubal ligation in 1984. Nine years later, in 1993, when she was married to her third husband, Wendell, she told him that she was pregnant on three different occasions. In one instance, Kimmy and Wendell went to a hospital in Iowa. As Wendell was sitting in the waiting room, a call came in for him. He said a female caller advised him that his wife just had a little boy, but the boy had died. After that, the caller disconnected. Shortly after this, Kimmy came into the waiting room crying and maintaining the same story. Kimmy named the boy Zachary and even had a funeral for him. She buried a coffin that supposedly contained his remains, along with a few other items. After Kimmy was arrested for murder, Wendell contacted the authorities. Investigators went to the cemetery and retrieved the coffin. No human remains were in it. There never was a Zachary. The hospital had no record of his birth, and neither did the state. Kimmy was able to get away with her scam because the cemetery did not require a death certificate. Maybe the cemetery was trying to expand their market. I can imagine some funeral executive at a board meeting saying something like, do we have to limit our customers to just dead people? Instead of thinking outside the box, he was thinking outside the coffin. Item number three, a mental health clinician who evaluated Kimmy called her, quote, a little bit different, unquote, but also stated that she did not meet the standards for the insanity or diminished responsibility defenses. Some have argued that this case could involve a phenomenon known as delusion of pregnancy or phantom pregnancy. This is when a woman believes she is pregnant even though she is not. With this condition, a woman would often manifest several physical symptoms of pregnancy, like morning sickness, increased appetite, and weight gain. This condition involves a delusion, which is a fixed false belief. A woman with the condition would be considered psychotic. The theory behind the etiology of the condition is that the delusion meets some type of need, like it would satisfy loneliness, compensate for not having children, or prevent the loss of a romantic relationship, like maybe the woman was with a partner who was going to leave her if she didn't have a child. The theory that Kimmy had delusion of pregnancy is interesting, but there is no indication that she did. She was not psychotic, and she did not actually believe she was pregnant. Kimmy knew that she was faking it. If she was delusional, she would not have murdered Teresa to take her son. Another theory in this case is that Kimmy perpetrated the crime to please Robert, but that doesn't explain her previous fake pregnancy when she was married to Wendell. Kimmy demonstrated a pattern of faking pregnancies. Item number four, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Kimmy pretended to be pregnant to satisfy a sense of entitlement and to be the center of attention. When she first started, she did not intend to kill anyone, but that changed after she met Teresa. Now Kimmy had an opportunity to keep her scam going indefinitely. Instead of perpetrating another Zachary incident, like pretending her child died and faking a funeral, Kimmy decided to elevate her scam to a higher level. To Kimmy, Teresa's life did not matter. Murder was not an obstacle. With a singular focus, Kimmy took several direct and clumsy steps toward homicide, 
like asking a salesperson if a gun could remove a person's head. She did not realize how her behavior was perceived by other people. Kimmy lacked insight and assumed that she could manipulate anyone. Now moving to my final thoughts. Initially, it was difficult for people to believe that Kimmy was a killer, especially based on the bizarre motive in this case. It was like Kimmy was hiding in plain sight, believing that no one would ever suspect that she would perpetrate such a heinous and unusual crime. This case demonstrates how, on some occasions, attempting to hide in plain sight is a lot like advertising one's crime. Those are my thoughts on the case of Kimmy Hardy. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.